The National Broadcasting Company presents The Big Show, the first half hour presented by the makers of Reynolds Aluminum, the Reynolds Metals Company, and starring the glamorous, unpredictable Tallulah Bankhead. For the next hour and 30 minutes, you will be entertained by some of the biggest names in show business. Such bright stars as... Fred Allen. Phil Foster. Julie Harris. Portland Hoffa. Groucho Marx. Ethel Merman. William Prince. George Sander. Earl Wrightson. Meredith Wilson. And my name, darlings, is Tallulah Bankhead. <laughs> Darlings, I'm a little sad today. This is our last show of the season. It has been a turbulent 30 weeks, but despite the squabbles and the temperamental outbursts, all of us on the show have learned to know and appreciate each other to the fullest. And thank heaven we won't have to look at each other again for four months. <laughs> and to you, darlings, our listeners, thanks for those thousands of letters. I've read every one of them, and believe me when I say in all sincerity, I don't know how they allow stuff like that in the mail. <laughs> I don't know where people get their impressions of me. Like that dyspeptic critic a few years ago, he fancied himself a wit and wrote this neurotic line, quote, a day away from Tallulah is like a month in the country. <laughs> so after our final show today, it looks like all of you will have a delightful summer. But what happened to me? Where do I go to get away from myself? Oh, well, I'm going to miss you all terribly, and especially our darling sponsor and his lovely checks. <laughs> and made out, too, to aluminum Bankhead. <laughs> I can hardly wait till our return engagement. Well, Miss Bankhead, here's another return engagement that everybody is looking forward to eagerly. The return of Reynolds Wrap, the original and genuine, the pure aluminum foil in handy kitchen rolls. When military needs for aluminum took most of this favorite wrap away, there was a promise made. Remember? The advertisements showed packages of Reynolds wrap flying off like jet planes with the caption, Return Flight Guaranteed. Well, it's coming closer now. There's more Reynolds wrap on the way for roasting meat to juicy perfection, for covering bowls and wrapping leftovers. It's still hard to find on store shelves, but it's becoming more and more plentiful as aluminum production keeps expanding. Keep asking for Reynolds Wrap, that bright symbol of the age of aluminum. Reynolds Aluminum. Well, darlings, we might as well begin our last show of the season on a happy note. A loud happy note. <laughs> because Ethel Merman is going to sing. For our selection tonight, Ethel has chosen a song which she has made into a classic. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Musical Comedy herself singing Heat Wave. Meredith Darling, if you please. <laughs> feet wave and in such a way that the customers say that she certainly can 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 wave, wait until you see how the mercury jumps to 93 yes so we're having a heat wave a tropical heat wave the temperature's rising it isn't surprising she certainly can Break it up, break it up. 
Ethel, after that lusty bit of singing, I'm sure our listeners would like a moment to straighten out the pictures on their walls. <laughs> so, uh, darling, let's have a little chat. And since this is our last show this season, how about keeping it on a friendly basis? Why, certainly, Tallulah. After all, you know what I think of you. <laughs> oh, starting right in, are you? Oh, no. I mean, I think of you as the greatest actress in the theater. As a matter of fact, all the critics called you the greatest actress in the theater 20 years ago. My dear girl, and I say that advisedly, <laughs> nobody has called you that in 20 years. I only wanted to bring up a coincidence, so stop it, Ethel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no stamina, she breaks up all the time. <laughs> but isn't it strange that my show closes tonight and your show, Call Me Madam, closes in a couple of weeks? Well, what's strange about that? Your show always did close before mine. <laughs> Are you implying that your shows have been more successful than mine? Who's implying? I just came out and said it. <laughs> uh, look who just came out. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> what am I getting upset about? It's so nice to know that in an hour and a half, you'll be last season show. <coughs> Over, Ethel. I suppose... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, nobody gave me that cut. <laughs> <laughs> Tallulah, you're mad. <laughs> no, darling, I'm not angry. I didn't say angry. I said you're mad. Wild, uninhibited, unpredictable, you know, crazy. <laughs> but I don't care what you say about me. It doesn't hurt me. I'm too thick-skinned. Took the words right out of my own venomous mouth, darling. <laughs> well, now, what's the use of pursuing this any further? You know what the first moron said to the second moron. No, Tallulah, what did you say to the second moron? I said, Ethel, I said. <laughs> well, I guess that's my fault. I should have taken my vacation a couple of weeks earlier. <laughs> well, where are you going on your vacation, darling? <laughs> <laughs> She's worse than Chevy Durante. <laughs> to the coast. <laughs> oh, isn't this rather early in the season for Far Rockaway? <laughs> Hollywood. I'm going to make a picture out there. Call me Madam. Oh, yes. You're always in those musicals. I take my play straight. <laughs> like you do everything else. <laughs> How would you like two fingers right now? One in each eye. Oh, excuse me, ladies. That's ladies. <laughs> Indeed. George, this is Ethel Merman. She's the dearest friend I have. Pity. <laughs> Tallulah, you're not introducing me to George. I know him. George is playing opposite me in the picture we're making this summer. <laughs> so you two are going out to Hollywood to make a picture. Nobody cares what happens to me. I'll be here all by myself, friendless, helpless, just wasting away all by my lonesome. Self-pity. <laughs> my dear ladies, and I use the word in a broad sense. <laughs> We've been standing here for some minutes having a delightful chat, haven't you? And while standing here, I experienced the fond hope that I would die. What makes you think you haven't, darling? <laughs> because this obviously is not heaven. Well, George, why don't you prove it isn't by singing? Ladies and gentlemen, it was during our first show of this season in London that we discovered that Mr. Sanders was the possessor of a brilliant and exciting singing voice. He was a terrific hit when we sang, when he sang for us at the Palladium Theater, Ivan Novella's lovely ballad, Someday My Heart Will Awake. So we've asked him to reprise it for us tonight. Meredith, if you please. <laughs>
<laughs> and now, darlings, there are a lot of different versions of that springtime urge. But here's a constructive one from the Reynolds Metals Company. Yes, Miss Bankhead, and we mean constructive, literally. Spring is the season when the homeowner feels the urge to build, repair, remodel. If you are putting in insulation, make it Reynolds Aluminum Reflective Insulation for a quick, efficient job at lowest cost. It's embossed aluminum foil on craft paper and it reflects up to 95% of radiant heat. Throws off sun heat in summer. Turns winter heat back inside. So convenient. 250 square feet in one 15 pound roll ready to staple or tack up. Ask your dealer about this and about Reynolds Lifetime Aluminum Gutters. The big low cost improvement for your home. Ask him to show you Reynolds Aluminum Windows the better finished windows in casement, awning, and double hung types. Remember, your dollars are still worth 100 cents in aluminum, the only basic metal price no higher than before World War II. That's the result of an industry made competitive by Reynolds, the Reynolds Metals Company, one of America's great producers of aluminum. <laughs> Well, last week, two comparative newcomers appeared on the big show, Fred Allen and Groucho Marx. Uh, they were an instantaneous hit with their recollection of the good old days of show business. Uh, what's old, fellas? Well, to begin with, it, the two of us. Say, Groucho, tonight I brought along my vaudeville scrapbook. Grab a gander at these theater programs. Hmm. Keith time, the Orpheum Psycho, the Pan time. Uh huh. These ought to bring back some memories. They sure do, Fred. Huh? Oh, to be seventy again. Huh? <laughs> oh, that's gonna be tough. To huh? <laughs> Beat it, Tallulah, will you? <laughs> Ground show. Here's the first. I was just wetting my finger while the oh. music. I had to turn the music. I'll turn. How about wetting to Lola while she's over? <laughs> See, here's the. Here's the first. <laughs> the first page in my scrapbook, Groucho. This is a snap of me the day I arrived in New York. Hmm, looks like one of those posters you see every spring. Underneath it says, "Send this boy to camp." <laughs> Say, how did you first come to New York, Groucho? I won a male beauty contest. You won a beauty contest? Yeah, I was the only male who showed up. <laughs> I was Mr. America for 1910. You can imagine what shape the country was in back in 1910. <laughs> Say, you look better than the country does today. <laughs> Everybody says I have Gable's eyes, Gregory Peck's profile, James Mason's mouth, and Gary Cooper's ears. Why is it when you get me all together, I look like Senator Toby? <laughs> Well, Groucho, if you look better in pieces, why bother getting yourself together? Fred, be thankful I'm alive. If I ever die, you'll be the homeliest man in the world. 
say, Groucho, here's a picture. Look at this. This is a theatrical boarding house I lived in on 38th Street, Mrs. Brown's. Oh, yes. I had a, I had a room. It was so small, it had removable doorknobs. <laughs> if you wanted to bend over in your room, you could take off the doorknob just in case. <laughs> I lived in the Bartholdi Inn. My room was so small, if somebody opened the door, the doorknob got into bed with me. <laughs> Fred, you haven't lived until you've had a doorknob sneak up on you on a cold morning. <laughs> See, at Mrs. Brown's, when you took a bath, you had to keep singing. There was no lock on the bathroom door. <laughs> Our joint had no bathtub. Saturday night, they left a bottle of salsa and a sponge in the hall. <laughs> the sponge was Mr. Brown. <laughs> Say, here's a program. Look at this, Groucho. Oh, yes, that's very the interesting. The first... Uh, moth eating there. Yes, it is. Well, was a moth was the man... No, it's probably something getting into your eye there. No. Your pupil is a little shabby. It was moth and fry, <laughs> I think. <laughs> yeah. They had some good material, too, the moth yes, got did, at it. Huh? This is the, this program, the first job I got as an actor, Groucho, the Barter Theater in Nutley, New Jersey. Oh, yes. It was on a farm. The first week the company was there, a turkey died. The actors got turkey to eat every night. The next week a cow died, we had beef every night. Then the manager got sick, and I quit. <laughs> My first job was with a show called Getting Gertie's Garter. Really? You remember that? Yes. I played in Getting Gertie's Garter for two years. I was determined, but unsuccessful. <laughs> See, here's a notice, look. Oh, yes, the Happy Hour Theater, Akron, Ohio. Did you ever play the Happy Hour, Groucho? Fred, the unhappiest hours of my life were spent in the Happy Hour. <laughs> Say, here's a program, remember this theater? Oh, the gem in Pocatello, Idaho. Uh-huh. Yes, if the audience didn't like your act, they threw potatoes at you. That's right. That's how Toffinetti got his start. <laughs> He saved his potatoes and came east with a large bag. Who shall be nameless at this yes. time? I imagine that was Mrs. Toppinetti. <laughs> she finally ran away with Mr. Brown. Oh, really? <laughs> with the salsa? And the sponge, yes. <laughs> Do you remember the Quonset Biltmore? That motel where the actor stopped in Pocatello? Oh, yes. No steps on the front. It was Western style. Yes. Every room had a private well and an Indian sitting in the corner. <laughs> An Indian sitting in the room? Yes, if it got cold during the night, you could get up and take the blanket off the Indian. <laughs> I finally took the Indian off the blanket. <laughs> the turned out to be Mr. Brown. Oh. <laughs> what happened to the cell? He was hiding a sponge there. <laughs> the closet built more. Wasn't that the place where the dining room ceiling was so low? If you ordered frog's legs, they served the frog's legs squatting. <laughs> No, no, that's true, that's true. How about that fresh oxtail soup? If you said a kind word to the soup, the oxtail would start wagging. <laughs> if you wanted cream in your... <laughs> There's a, a relative of Miss, Mr. Brown over the floor. <laughs> yes, the Quonset built more. Stand up and show your sponge. <laughs> Biltmore. Where were we? Uh, at the Quonset Biltmore. We're still in Pocatello, no. in the dining room. If you wanted cream in your coffee, a cow backed up to the table. I remember. After the first meal, I took my coffee black. <laughs> that place, that place was so cheap. Real cheap, wasn't oh, it? Oh, cheap. Thank you. They used to roughen I'm the bottom. Helping is joke here. I keep saying real cheap. <laughs> You're helping it up to now. You'll kill the end of it, you know. <laughs> Let's go back to Pocatello, all right? Let's go back to Mr. Brown. He was doing yes. real well up earlier. Say he missed his sponge, huh? <laughs> See, that, that place was so cheap. Wait a minute. After the meal, I took my coffee black. We'll try that again. Huh? <laughs> This is another meal came up in the script. That place was so cheap, they used to roughen the bottom of the cups to make the actors think they had sugar in their coffee. I killed that for you, you good. Sure? <laughs> Sorry, Fred. I remember the week I played in Pocatello. The circus was there. That was the week the Siamese twins came apart. Well, how could the Siamese twins come apart? They tried to go through a revolving door. <laughs> that was stretching the thing too far. 
I forget the details. Well, <laughs> probably just as well, Groucho. The circus was all upset that week. The dog-faced boy married the fat lady. Really? Later, they had a son who looked like a greyhound bus. <laughs> Good old Pocatello. Yes. That's where I met the French soldier. He was joining a woman to forget the foreign legion. <laughs> Say, here's a, here's a clipping. Is, did you ever play here? Did you uh, ever? Oh, the Cactus Plaza, Las Vegas. Are you kidding? Las Vegas, that's the ca gambling center of the West. Yes, even the kids on the street will match your pennies. I showed one little kid a picture of an eagle. I said, Sonny, do you know what this is? The kid said, sure, it's tails. <laughs> Las Vegas is some town. In the, in the car. It's not a good time for jokes. <laughs> we did better in Pocatello. In the coffee shop. There's a man keeps walking by here and waving. <laughs> in the coffee shop. So you can say what you want, but, but uh, in to, Las uh, Vegas. <laughs> What about the coffee shop, Fred? Well, I say, I was just going to say, you can say what you want about gamblers, but in Las Vegas, they're really good-hearted. Yes. Well, 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 what were you going to say? <laughs> in my room, the dial phone was a little roulette wheel. The operator would give me odds that I couldn't get a number. <laughs> well, I can... Tried to sneak out of that joke. Yes, I was trying to save a little time. <laughs> But uh, I, was, I reiterate, gamblers are good-hearted. Yeah, they show. sure, they sure are. When I was in Las Vegas, one of the gambling houses was running a benefit for a church. A benefit for a church in a gambling house? Yeah. How did it come out? The church lost $600. <laughs> <laughs> Say, remember this act topping the bill, J. Gaffney Smith and Diamond Doll Fogarty? Oh, very well. Gosh, I can see J. Gaffney now with those big buck teeth. He always looked as though he was spitting out a mahjong set. <laughs> He used to hang his head so much, his teeth wore a hole in his vest. And Diamond Doll, remember she was so thin? Oh, was she skinny. From the back, she looked like a closed umbrella. <laughs> they were always fighting. She said he was too cheap to buy a toothbrush. After eating a meal, he'd whistle to clean his teeth. <laughs> See, I remember one day, Jay Gaffney hit Diamond Doll right across the face with his toupee. He had a zipper in his toupee. He used to pull it back a little to make a part. And Diamond Doll was furious. She said, as low as you are, Jay Gaffney, look down and you will find my opinion of you. That marriage couldn't last. I said that in Bayonne. <laughs> I heard what you said. What finally, what finally happened? I went back to Bayonne. <laughs> no, she killed him. Really? One night between shows, Jay Gaffney was sitting in the dressing room eating some cold cuts. Diamond Doll pulled out a gun and shot him between the tongue and the liverwurst. <laughs> That's a tough way to go, Groucho, before you finished your cold cuts. Well, as new Bull Mara said, we all have to go someday. <laughs> Do you believe in reincarnation, Groucho? Do you really think that after an actor dies, he can come back in some form? Of course he can. I can prove it. Last night, I went into the stage delicatessen. A ham on the counter spoke to me. Really? A ham spoke? It was probably some act I worked with years ago. <laughs> What did you do? What could I do? I ordered corned beef. I couldn't eat a brother performer. Thank you, darlings, for a memorable spot on our big show. We are particularly privileged tonight to have with us an old friend of the big show, Earl Wrightson, who is about to sing a thrilling new song, Freedom. This word, freedom, is a treasured word a sacred word, bought for us with the blood of patriots, a word that sounds in our ears and rings in our hearts with the voice of the Liberty Bell. But this same magic word is known to all the peoples of earth and is sung in every tongue. Meredith Wilson has taken this word as expressed in 35 mother tongues, 35 cries of freedom around the world, and he has blended them together in a poem of freedom. Listen now to the glorious baritone voice of Earl Wrightson with the orchestra and chorus in the Freedom Song. Freedom, that is a word that every man and every woman and every child should learn to speak in every tongue. Italian, Portuguese, Spanish. Libertà! Libertà! Icelandic, German, Polish. Welsie! 
Hungarian, Russian, Scandinavian. Zabuchov, Svoboda! Rehink! French, Armenian, Burmese. Liberté! Azaruchun, Kukorki! Chinese, Malayan, Philippine. Shio! Murdeka! Kaliyaon! Albanian, Indonesian, Ethiopian. Maria! Humanikaon! The Sonnet! Siamese, Gaelic, Welsh. Isarakab! Sirish! Ratnit! Finnish, Persian, English. Bataus! Azadi, freedom. Sanskrit, Hebrew, Turkish. Wadinata. Kairut. Hurriyet. Esperanto, Hawaiian, Korean. Vivarezzo. Ukawa. Jayu. Japanese, Greek, Yugoslavian. Zio. Latvia. Ramadan. Arabian. Al-Hurriya. Latvia. Libertad, a libertad, let freedom ring, let freedom ring. Well, see, fry, hide, pull, loose, sabu, jog, let every voice and nation sing. Sabu, the great liberty for every living thing. Libertad, a libertad, let freedom ring, let freedom ring. As a tune, as a tune, look not ye, who go amor te ca. Rooted Bathaus, Azadi, 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 All right, son, and congratulations to you, Meredith. We'll all be eagerly awaiting the great RCA recording. I know that song will make. And now, darlings, here's Bert Collin with the closing message, at least uh, for the big show season at the moment, from our really darling sponsor, the Reynolds Metals Company. Thank you, Miss Bankhead, and thank you, our listening audience. In these past months, we've spoken of many of the uses of aluminum. Now we offer you free a fascinating booklet, The ABCs of Aluminum. The story of aluminum itself, how it was discovered, what it is and what it does. Interesting reading for everybody, useful information for students and teachers. If you would like your free copy, just write aluminum on a postcard with your name and address and address it to Reynolds Metals Company, Louisville 1, Kentucky. That's the Reynolds Metals Company, Louisville 1, Kentucky. This is not a story of the Reynolds Company, you know. It's the story of aluminum itself. You'll want to read it. Send for your free copy. And keep it to remind you of the Reynolds Metals Company, pioneers of progress through aluminum. Before we go to Act Two, just give me a moment to ring my chimes. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.
This is The Big Show, Act Two, and here again is Tallulah. Well, darlings, here we go with the second act of The Big Show, our final show of the season. Oh, I'm getting sad about the minute. Relax, Tallulah. So what if it is the last show of the season? Take it easy. Oh, Fred, what do you know about it? Me? Well, I've been on more last shows than anybody in radio. <laughs> There's nothing to get excited about a last show of the season, Tulu. The world will go right on spinning around you instead of vice versa. So forget about the show and concentrate on having a good vacation. Well, where are you in Portland going on your vacation? Well, I'd like to go to Paris where we went last summer and then visit all those other romantic places like Venice, Cannes, Nice, Barrett's. Well, where are you going on your vacation? Red Bank, New Jersey. <laughs> Red Bank? Fred wants to go to Red Bank. Well, why not? The American dollar is as worth as much in Red Bank as it is anywhere in the United States. But, Fred, I'd rather go to Nice than Red Bank, New Jersey. Well, I've got a niece in Red Bank, New Jersey. <laughs> and that's where we're going, with Mr. Brown and the sponge and the sponge. <laughs> we're putting it all together. Yes, Fred. Oh, this is pitiful. Now, Portland, I want to speak to you. A married woman doesn't say yes all the time. That's for single girls. But Fred says... <laughs> Who cares what Fred says? Now, just a minute, Miss Bankhead. I've been listening to this conversation, and, Porty, I think it's a shame the way you let Fred run your life. But Fred always has decided what we do. Why should he? You're a woman, aren't you? We women have got to start asserting ourselves, make the men realize what they've got, and we're going to advertise it. That's right. Remember our new slogan, women are better than ever. <laughs> Yes, an exhaustive laboratory test proved that four out of five men prefer women. <laughs> the fifth one is dead. <laughs> women come in several attractive shades. Blonde, ash blonde, platinum blonde, red, titian, auburn, brunette, brownette. And that new exciting color, natural. <laughs> So get a woman. The 52 model comes completely equipped with all accessories. Order one now from your local dealer. And, and tell him Groucho sent you. <laughs> now look here, Paul. Let us put you straight. The important thing you've got to know is that you're boss. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the mystery boy. <laughs> the three ladies on stage are indulging in little female superiority. I will attempt to translate. This, of course, will be a broad translation. Portland, the first thing you've got to know is that a woman wears the pants in the family. Translation. If she would switch from slacks to skirts, she would have a family to wear the pants in. Portland, marriage is a 50-50 proposition. Translation. The wife buys a dress for $50, and the husband buys a tie for 50 cents. But... A woman's place is in the home. A woman's place in the home, indeed. Women have taken their rightful place in the world. They're in everything. They're mixed up with politics. They're in the arts. They're mixed up with industry. What she's trying to say is that women are mixed up. <laughs> One of our greatest Americans is a woman. Look at Mrs. Roosevelt. If... Bravo! If Mrs. Roosevelt would stop moving around so much, we'd all be able to take a look at her. <laughs> Does Fred go away in the morning and leave you home all day? Oh, I'm all alone all day. When a woman says she is all alone all day, she is usually playing canasta with three other women who are also all alone all day. <laughs> and the husband has to float alone to pay her losses. Now, Paul, look here, you must take a stand. Now, I was talking to a friend of mine, Mrs. Phillips, the sweetest girl you'd want to meet. What she went through with her husband, well, darling, life was just unbearable. He made her miserable till the day he died, 25 years ago. I have a friend, too, a wonderful girl. She travels all over the world now with her maid and chauffeur. And do you know her husband made her life impossible until she discovered arsenic? <laughs> I know what you mean, because one of my dearest friends lives on a beautiful ranch out west. I think they call it Texas. Her husband was just awful. She had such trouble. He lingered on for three weeks after they were married. <laughs> These three husbands they're talking about are not dead. They are hiding. 
However, if I may step out of character, I would like to defend womanhood. Not all wives are this callous. I know of a woman whose husband left her a $100,000 insurance policy, and she is so bereaved, she would willingly give up half of it if she could get him back. <laughs> well, darlings, we can't let this season go by without fulfilling a request. We keep getting over and over again. Particularly for me. <laughs> it's to repeat a little adventure I had some weeks ago. Well, I had to take a long trip on some very important business upstate somewhere. 181st Street and Broadway. <laughs> well, I'd given my chauffeur the evening off, and naturally he took the car. I didn't know what to do, so I called the airport. But there was no flight to 181st Street. <laughs> Well, you know, to make matters worse, it was raining cats and dogs, and I couldn't get a taxi. Ha! Huh? So what do you think? I discovered a brand new method of transportation. It's called, I believe, the subway. <laughs> oh, have you heard of it, darling? Ah, oh, it's wonderful. Now, a friend of mine who knows all about such things uh, pointed me uh, towards some stairs leading down a dark hole in the ground, <laughs> and I found myself at a ticket booth. So I said to the man in tennis, I said, oh, Darling, I've got to go to 181st Street. I'd like a drawing room, please. <laughs> what? No drawing room? Oh, very well. I'll take a bedroom. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> well, I'm not going to sit up for the entire trip. <laughs> what do you mean, stand up? <laughs> a strap? <laughs> oh, very well. How much are they, darling? Free? Oh, how generous. Now, let me see. Now, how much is the ticket? Ten cents. Ten cents? Oh, yes. Darling, how reasonable. Oh, you'll take my check, of course. <laughs> oh, but whenever I make a trip, I always pay by check. It's for income tax purposes. <laughs> it's quite all right, darling. I'm Tallulah Bank Bankhead. <laughs> oh, Mr. Bonaparte, how do you do? <laughs> Now, uh, tell me, darling, uh, how, how do I get the train? Through that turnstile? Uh, just drop a dime in the slot? But I haven't a dime. No, I never carry any cash. Oh, thank you, darling. It's awfully kind of you. You're giving me this? No strings attached? Oh, just go away. <laughs> well, you're very sweet. Goodbye, darling. Well, I guess I wait for the train here. I like my cigarette. Oh, dear, I'm out of matches. Oh, fireman, may I have a match, please? <laughs> what sign? Oh, I see. Oh, here comes the train. Well, I think it's the train. Where's the engine? <laughs> Darling, you! Who stopped for me? Oh, thank you. Uh, just a minute. Stop pushing me. Oh, not you, sir. I was talking to that woman. <laughs> You go right ahead. <laughs> well, now, I think I'll find a seat by the window. Excuse me. Pardon me. I beg your pardon. Excuse me. Why are you all standing here? <laughs> well, why don't you go to your seats? <laughs> uh, I beg your pardon, uh, darling. Uh, uh, um, uh, which way is the dining car? <laughs> there isn't? Well, I never heard of such a... I beg your pardon, miss. Is my eye hurting your elbow? <laughs> Who do I think I am? I'm Tallulah Bankhead. Oh, how do you do, Mrs. Bonaparte? <laughs> well, I just met your husband upstairs. He's really... <laughs> no, he really is the kindest, the sweetest man. He gave me a dime. Yes, you see, this is my first trip on this train. Awfully crowded, isn't it? And, and so stuffy. Yes, it is hot and stuffy and sticky. I think I'll just loosen my belt. There we are. So, you're toggled. Oh, I beg your pardon. <laughs> oh, and you can't be heard from. Yes, it is my first trip. So what? What do you mean, where am I going? I'm going up to, uh, well, just a minute. Uh, just let me find that address. I have it in my pocketbook here. Oh, here we are. A $10 bill? I didn't think I had any money. What's that, madam? You'll have who arrested for pickpocketing? <laughs> oh, I'm terribly sorry, darling. It's so, it's so crowded. Yes, I'm going up to 181st Street and Broadway. 
I'm in where? In Brooklyn. <laughs> Conductor, pilot, help! Stop the train. I've got to get off. Uh, which way to the American Embassy? <laughs> Well, darling, we have a scoop on the big show. 20th Century Fox has signed Ethel Merman and uh, George Sanders for the picture version of Call Me Madam. Before they even make the picture, we're going to hear the duet which Ethel and George will sing in Call Me Madam. Why wait 20 years to hear it on television? <laughs> uh, Meredith, if you're ready, let's listen to Miss Merman and Mr. Sanders singing Marrying for Love, if you please. <laughs> Ten generations of constant times Live very comfortable lives They were contented to live in style Supported by their wives Daughters of men who were wealthy Fitted them like a glove They all married for money I mean to marry for love it's an old-fashioned idea, marrying for love. And that old-fashioned idea is what I'm thinking of. Where there's love, poets have said, you can live as one. That's an old-fashioned idea. But it's being done When I find that man that I'm crazy about There's much that I could do without But I couldn't do without love Just, Just an, an old-fashioned romance With, with the, the moon, moon above, above. Marrying for love That's the kind of love That I'm thinking of Bravo, Ethel Norman and George Sanders Aren't they divine? And isn't it utterly revolting that a movie producer would match up a great voice like Sanders and call me madam with a great voice like Merman's when they could have had me? <laughs> I've got to do something about that combination. Oh, George! Watch me give the umpche the isness, baby. <laughs> uh, George Sanders. S E A. <laughs> oh, George. Uh, for your first uh, musical picture, and this is going to be your first musical, don't you think you should have someone singing with you who isn't quite so overpowering, I mean, not so bombastic, someone who is a little more delicate and more um, southern, I mean, more subtle, <laughs> someone who won't try to hog the whole picture, someone who's willing to back you up, who's willing to make a sacrifice if necessary, in short, someone who'll play ball with you. I will not co-star with Yogi Berra. <laughs> So handsome, but what a shamil. <laughs> Maybe I can get this into your head. I'll come right to the point. I want that part in Call Me Madam. You? Out of the question. You couldn't possibly sing my part. No, I mean... <laughs> idiot, I mean Ethel Merman. Well, she couldn't sing my part either. <laughs> oh, I could. I could. I could sing that part with my mouth tied behind my back. Ah, you, Groucho. Yes, me, Groucho. Who are you? Huh? I'm Anna Mae Wong And this is Freddie Bartholomew Oh, television stars huh? <laughs> Bartholomew, I like you And I'm going to do something for you Indeed Pity <laughs> I'm going to get you into pictures We'll change your name to George Sanders Well, I'm already in pictures Well, I can get you out of pictures <laughs> What's a tall, handsome man like you Doing in pictures anyway? Guys like you that make it tough for guys like me. <laughs> I've been in pictures. Did you ever see me, Tallulah? I never could. 
Would you care to step outside and say that? No, I wouldn't. Well, go ahead. I'll take over. <laughs> well, darling. <laughs> Glamorous and unmentionable Groucho Banker. <laughs> oh, George, you're not going to stand there and let him do this to me, are you? Haven't you been listening to what he's been saying, this Groucho? My contract Fighting specifies. My, <laughs> my contract specifies that I'm only to perform on this show. Uh, there's nothing that says I must listen to it. <laughs> now, there's a man after my own heart. And I'll throw in my appendix. <laughs> I was going to have it out anyway. Groucho, you're a madman. That's what I was talking about. Call me madman. <laughs> well, Sanders, are you going to give up this ridiculous idea of fooling around with a picture with Ethel Merman? Or better still, you fool around with a picture and I'll fool around with Ethel Merman. <laughs> Maybe she'll get me into the picture. I know all the songs from it. Ha <laughs> ha, this I've got to hear. Let me hear you sing something from Call Me Madam. Oh, George, you're sort of a critic. You be the judge. Go ahead, Groucho. Okay. Some enchanted evening <laughs> You will meet a strangler what, what do you think, Judge? Ninety days Besides, Groucho, that's from South Pacific Do you know anything from Call Me Madam? Of course Don't throw bouquets at me Don't please my folks too much That's in Oklahoma, and why aren't you? <laughs> I'll buy that now for my final selection, the hit song from Call Me Madam. I get no kick from John Payne. <laughs> Lauren Bacall doesn't thrill me at all. And that goes for Johnny Ray, too. <laughs> but I get a kick out of you. Well, Judge, what do you say? And you thought that I was a schlemiel. <laughs> Groucho, if that's a sample of your ability, how did you ever get into pictures? Just fade. I was sitting in a drugstore sipping a soda when a scout discovered me. And that scout signed me up. The next thing I knew, I was a campfire girl. <laughs> a campfire girl? I was wearing a sweater at the time. <laughs> I'd still be with him if we hadn't gone swimming that summer. <laughs> You were in over your head, huh? <laughs> you didn't get it? Oh, well, press on. They and got it. They got it. <laughs> no, but this they idea... They didn't want it. <laughs> <laughs> they laughed in rehearsals. Thank you, musicians. As you are now, with this idea of yours, you're playing in Call Me Madam. It would be silly for you to be singing the romantic song from Call Me Madam. I will not accept that, Tuller. I sing a love song very well. As a matter of fact, I have a love song here written by my friend Harry Ruby. Would you like to sing it? I sure would. What's the name of it? Show me a rose. Okay, let's hear it. <laughs> well, then, it, I guess there's no stopping him. We have a request from Groucho Marx to hear Groucho Marx saying, Show me a rose. Meredith, on your mark, get set, Groucho, if you please. Ever since songwriters started writing songs, they have written songs about a rose. Lovely rose. Red roses, blue roses, old roses, new roses Roses from the south and east and west But here's the rose song that I love the best Show me a rose, I'll show you a girl who cares Show me a rose, or leave me alone Show me a rose, I'll show you a stag at bay. Show me a rose, or leave me alone. She taught me how to do the tango, down where the palm trees sway. I called her Rose Amia, and she called a spade a spade. Show me a rose, I'll show you a storm at sea. Show me a rose, or leave me alone. One night in Omaha, Nebraska, we watched the clouds roll by. I said, my dear, how are you? And she whispered, so am I <laughs> Show me a rose I'll show you a girl named Sam <laughs> Show me a rose 
Show me a rose or leave me alone. Show me a rose, <laughs> a fragrant rose. Make believe that you don't know me until you show me. Maybe I'm crazy. As a matter of fact, that's one of the requirements to like a song like that. Well, we couldn't do our final show of the season without inviting Phil Foster to take a bow along with us. He has contributed greatly to our programs, and I hope he has a wonderful summer. What are your plans for the summer, Phil? Well, I'm going to play at the Riviera for a couple of weeks. The Riviera? Darling, oh, how divine. My favorite resort. There's nothing quite so luxurious as lying there with the cooling waters of the Mediterranean and those romantic nights under starlit skies. What Mediterranean? I'm talking about Bill Miller's Riviera across the bridge in New Jersey. <laughs> romantic nights. Who needs them? But still, when a bachelor gets to be my age, he begins to worry about the future. He doesn't want to go through life alone. Well, I figure someday I'll need companionship, someone to love him. Someone to bring me my pipe and slippers. So last month, I took the big step. I bought a dog. <laughs> I figured getting a dog has certain advantages over getting a wife. For one thing, the license is cheaper. <laughs> and the dog already has a fur coat. <laughs> and believe me, a poodle cut still looks better on a dog than it does on a wife. <laughs> So, I figured if I was going to get a dog, I only want the best, a thoroughbred. So I went to a high-class kennel club. I'll tell you, this kennel, kennel club was so exclusive, they got a sign outside that says, no dogs allowed. <laughs> that was the first time I was ever in one of those places. I didn't know how to address the owner of the kennel club. So I said, kenneler? <laughs> I would like to buy a dog. He said, fine. What about pedigree? Breeding is very important. I said... What do I care who the dog's parents were? He said, I'm talking about your mother and father. <laughs> now I was worried. There was a chance the dog may not even take me. I said, look, don't waste my time. I made this long trip up to Connecticut. Let's talk price. He said, our dogs cost $500 and up. What can I give you? I said, directions back to New York. <laughs> I think $500 is too much for me to spend for a trained dog. Because this year I expect to do very little fox hunting on Flappish Avenue. <laughs> and in my neighborhood, Tally Ho is the name of a deck of cards. <laughs> well, I know nothing at all about dogs, but I had a friend whose dog was about to give birth. So I asked him, after the blessed event, could I have one of the kittens? <laughs> What's the matter? It's wrong? <laughs> oh, puppies. Well, that shows you how little I know about dogs. Well, the child little the dog know about dogs, she had kittens. <laughs> oh, I had to go to the neighborhood's pet shop. These places always have about ten puppies in the window, and so pathetic. If you take one, his friend cries. If you take his friend, two other pups cry. If you don't take any, the owner of the store cries. So I said to the owner, I'll tell you, give me a dog. I don't want to spend too much money. So the owner said, if you want a big dog, I can give you a real buy. For $20, I can let you have a used Greyhound racing dog. <laughs> He's only got 4,000 miles on him. <laughs> I said, okay, I'll take him. The owner said, fine. You want to take him with you, or do you want him to eat you here? <laughs> so what am I going to do? I took the dog home, and I'm a bachelor. I don't know what to do. So I figured I'll take him over to my mother's house, and over there he'll eat with me. <laughs> so now my mother makes some meals no other dog even ever heard of. Dog biscuits with sour cream. <laughs> Red hot strudel. <laughs> but sometimes they don't get along. They argue over things like a bone. He wants to bury it and she wants to put it in a chicken soup. <laughs> but you know how grandmothers love to brag about their grandchildren? My mother's no different. Only she's ashamed to tell the neighbors that her Philly's baby is a dog. 
No, some grandmother say, her grandchild's only 10 months old, and he's starting to walk. So my mother say, so? Well, he's a little one, he's 10 weeks old, he jumps over fences. <laughs> Nowadays, the latest thing is to send your dog to school to be trained and educated. And the first thing you learn is that you gotta let the dog pick out his own name. So I tried it. I said, the Rover? He went, rah! I said, Fido? He went, rah! I said, Prince? He went, uh. <laughs> He picked out the name. You ready? Phil. <laughs> you think this can't be embarrassing? My friends call up my mother and say, Where's Phil? She says, Out chasing cats. <laughs> I tell you, in these schools, they teach the dogs how to help their masters. Me being a bachelor, I have now what is known as a bachelor retriever. I throw out a stick, he comes back with a girl. Throw out a red stick, comes back with a redhead. Throw out a yellow stick, comes back with a blonde. Last week, I want to mix them up a little bit, so I threw out a blue stick, came back with a cop. <laughs> I'll tell you, did you ever hear how some of these women talk to some of their dogs? Kills me. Hello, honey. Did you miss your mommy? <laughs> eh? Were you a good little boy when I was gone? Eh? Oh, you're such a nice little boy. Guess what I got for you? Come on, get. You ever hear the same wives talk to their husbands? <laughs> Harry! <laughs> Listen to your master. <laughs> Don't you bark at me? Just for that, I'm not taking your muzzle off. <laughs> to tell you the truth, I've been on a big show most of the winter long, the results of which I'm putting in a song. I was single when I started, and I'll be single at the end. Because to me, there ain't nothing more important than a girl to remain just like a friend. <laughs> I got news for you. If a person of the opposite sex should chance to pass by the candy store just at the time when me and a couple of chums are trying to figure out how them bums could manage to drop the flag when we were stitching games ahead, who needs her? <laughs> I got news for you. If a person of the opposite sex should smile and wrinkle up a cute little nose while me and the boys are in terrible shape from the struggle of trying to escape from the awful possibility of getting a job and having to go to work in the morning. Who needs her? Who needs her? Them girls is all the same. Who needs her? Every Brooklyn dame wants to change her name. I got news for you. <laughs> if a person of the opposite sex came up with the smell of the rose and the eyes of a pup and the hair of Kalu and the Dagmar built and the deep big gams and the merman walk and she understood Flatbush Avenue's talk. Who needs her? Who needs her? <laughs> Me! <laughs> That was hilarious, Phil. Now, before we go to Act Three, we'll be back in a moment just as soon as I ring my chimes. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. This is the big show, Act Three. This portion brought to you by Chesterfield. Ask your dealer for Chesterfield, the only cigarette that names all its ingredients. By Anison, for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. And by Dentine, the gum with breathtaking flavor. And Beeman's Pepsin, the gum that's great to chew and good for your digestion, too. And here again is Tallulah Bankhead. In a few moments, darlings, we are to share an exciting occasion on the big show. The presentation of this year's award of the New York Drama Critics Circle for the best American play produced on Broadway. It is John Van Druten's I Am a Camera. Adapted from Christopher Isherwood's Berlin Stories and produced at the Empire Theatre by Gertrude Macy and Walter Starkey. First, we are to hear a scene from this play, then the distinguished New York critic and this year's president of the Critics Circle, Mr. Gilbert Gabriel, will make the award. But uh, right now, Ed Hurley has a word to say. Yes, Miss Bankhead, it's time to sound off for Chesterfield. The mask is off in cigarette advertising. Chesterfield is first to name all its ingredients because you should know what gives you the best possible smoke. Chesterfield uses the right combination of the world's best tobaccos, pre-tested by laboratory instruments for the most desirable smoking qualities. 
and Chesterfields are kept tasty and fresh by pure, costly moistening agents entirely safe for use in the mouth, as proved by over 40 years of continuous use in tobacco products. And remember, your Chesterfields are wrapped in cigarette paper of the highest purity, the best money can buy. That's what Chesterfields are made of, the world's best tobaccos, pure, costly moistening agents, the best cigarette paper money can buy, nothing else. Only Chesterfield names its ingredients, and they give you the best possible smoke. Much milder, with an extraordinarily good taste, and most important, no unpleasant aftertaste. Ask your dealer for Chesterfields today. And now, darlings, a scene from this year's prize-winning play, John Van Druten's I Am a Camera, starring Miss Julie Harris and Mr. William Prince. <laughs> The scene, a boarding house in Berlin during the ominous days of 1930. The camera, Chris Isherwood, a young writer as portrayed by William Prince. The girl, Julie Harris as Sally Bowles. I am a camera with its shutter open, quite passive. Someday, all of this that I'm writing will have to be developed, printed, and fixed. I remember the first time I met Sally. I wondered how old she was. Her face was young, but her hands looked old. And they were dirty, too. I wrote, Sally's hands were like the old hands of a dirty little girl. After she'd been living in this boarding house a month or two, we had a quarrel. I didn't see her for two days. I went into her room. She had left her clothes all over the floor. She had had only half of her breakfast coffee. And some brandy, too. Oh, hello, Chris. <laughs> hello, Sally. I haven't seen you for a day and a half. I know. I've missed you, Chris. Well, I've missed you, too. I say, you don't look too well this morning. Oh, I've got a terrible hangover. <laughs> what were you doing last night? Oh, I was out with some people. I've been out both nights. Chris, I've been an awful fool, but don't scold me, please. <laughs> we never stopped going around, and then I got drunk and sentimental the first night. <gasps> oh, and I telephoned Mother in London. What on earth for? I suddenly felt like it. We had the most awful connection, and I couldn't hear a word. And then last night was worse. <laughs> we went to the most boring place. <laughs> Chris, I need someone to stop me. I really do. I wish I'd stayed home with you. Well, thank you, Sally. But you're awfully nice to come back to. And you're nice to have come back. I say, that sounds like a popular song. Oh, it does. Perhaps we could write it together and make a fortune. <laughs> you're awfully nice to come back to. You're awfully nice to come back. <laughs> you're, you're awfully, awfully nice, nice to come back. <laughs> I do think we belong together. And that little quarrel we had didn't mean anything, did it? I don't think two people can live as close as we do and not have them. But it was that that sent me out on that idiotic binge. Did you read the article I left you? The what, dear? My article. The one you asked me to write for your friend, the magazine editor. Oh, yes. I, I looked at it. Well? well? I'm terribly sorry, Chris, but it won't do. Why, what's wrong with it? But it's not nearly uh, snappy enough. Snappy? But it's all right, Christopher. I've got someone else to do it. Oh? Who? Kurt Rosenthal. I called him this morning. <laughs> well, who's he? <laughs> really, Chris? I thought you took an interest in the pictures. He's miles the best young scenario writer. He earns pots of money. <laughs> then why is he doing this? As a favor to me. Well, journalism isn't really in my line. But I do think you might have let me know. I didn't think you'd want to be bothered. And he would? Well, he doesn't make such a fuss about writing as you do. He's writing a novel in his spare time. He's so fearfully busy, he can only dictate it while he's having his bath. I bet that makes it wonderful. Well, he read me the first few chapters. Honestly, I think it's the best novel I've ever read. But that doesn't add up to very many, does it? He's the kind of author I really admire. He's not a bit stuck up, either. 
not like one of these young men who just because they've written one book start talking about art and imagining they're the most wonderful authors in the world. Just who are you talking about, Sally? Well, you do, Chris. You know you do. And it's silly to get jealous. Jealous? Who's jealous? There's no need to get upset either. I'm not upset. You don't like my article, all right? You needn't go on about it. I can't think why I expect you to do with that snappy little bird brain of yours. All your rich, successful friends either from whom you seem to have got all this stuff about me. Would you like to know what my friends said about you? No, I wouldn't. Well, I'll tell you. They said you were ruining me. That I've lost all my sparkle and my, my effervescence and it's all due to you. I've let you eat me up. Just sitting here pouring myself into you. Oh, is that what you've been doing? It's all you want. You're like a vampire. If you don't have people around you, just sit about in bars, waiting for someone to devour. You know, Chris, I'll tell you something. I've outgrown you. You what? I've gone beyond you. I'd better move away from here. All right. When? The sooner the better, I should think. That's fine with me. Good. So this is the end for Yes, if you want it that way. We'll probably bump into each other somewhere, sometime, I expect. Well, call me up sometime. Ask me around for a cocktail. I never know whether you're serious or not. Try it and find out if your friends will spare you the time. You know, you make me sick. Goodbye, Chris. What a little beast she is. Nothing would please me better than to see her whipped. That I care a curse what she thinks of my article. It's her criticism of myself. It's the awful flair women have for taking the stuffing out of men. I mismanaged our talk right from the beginning. I should have been wonderful, convincing, mature. I made the one fatal mistake. I let her say I was jealous. Well, I certainly won't see her again after all this. Never, never. Oh, Chris, the most awful things just happened. Guess who I met in the street right outside? I met Mother. Whose mother? Mine. I thought you said she was in London. She was, but that call of mine upset her. I suppose I did sound a bit drunk. Anyway, she jumped to conclusions and into an aeroplane. Oh, Chris, you're going to have to do something for me. I never told you, but... Well, I've written to her now and then. I mean, they do send me money from time to time. And, well, I gave her to understand when I first moved in here that we were engaged. That who was engaged? You and I to be married. Sally, you didn't. Well, I needed someone who sounded like a good, steady influence, and you were the best I could think of. She's in the sitting room. I told her this place was all untidy, but she'll be in in a minute. And I'm supposed to stand by and pretend? Chris, you, you no, owe it to No, Sally. You owe it to me. For what? Letting me eat you up? I'm sorry, and I'm going to my room. If you don't, I'll tell her the most awful things about you. I'm afraid I don't care. You tell her what you like. Chris, you can't do this to me. After the thing you just said to me, that I made you sick. But that was just an expression. No, Sally, we're through. Quite through. Well, we still can be after she goes home. Please, darling, please. <laughs> No matter what you now take for headache relief, we urge you to try Anacin for the incredibly fast relief these tablets bring the next time you're suffering from a headache. Now, the reason Anacin is so wonderfully fast-acting and effective is this. Anacin is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anacin contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thousands of people have received envelopes containing Anacin tablets from their own dentist or physician and in this way discovered the incredibly fast relief Anacin brings from pains of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. So the next time a headache strikes, take Anacin for this wonderfully fast relief. Anacin, A-N-A-C-I-N, Anacin at any drug counter in handy boxes of 12 and 30, economical family-sized bottles of 50 and 100. <laughs> And here, darlings, is the president of the New York Drama Critics Circle, Mr. Gilbert W. Gabriel, to present the scroll awarding Mr. John Van Druten the honor of having been chosen by majority vote of the New York Critics, the recipient of this year's prize for the best American play, Mr. Gabriel. Thank you, Miss Bankhead. 
we are proud to make the official presentation of the Critics Circle Award on the big show, not only because you belong to the theater, but because in carrying the background of the theater to this larger medium, you have again triumphed so completely as to win our sincerest admiration. Thank you. <laughs> For you, Mr. Van Druten, because your play, I Am a Camera, so impressed the majority of those voting in this year's awards of the New York Drama Critics Circle, I am privileged to present to you this scroll, citing your play as the best American play of the year. Congratulations, sir. Thank you, Mr. Gabriel, and all our thanks to the other members of the New York Drama Critics Circle, whose valued opinions and support made it possible for us to receive this honor. And Ms. Bankhead, may I express my sincere thanks to you for making it possible that I receive this award here on your television show. Uh, no, darling, this is not television, this is radio. Radio? You're still in radio. Just a minute, Buster. <laughs> Van Buster. <laughs> For your information, Mr. Van, uh, I'm a Druten. Radio is the mother of television. And who is the father? <laughs> a television darling has no father. <laughs> <laughs> well, television or radio, Tallulah, I came the moment I received your telegram. Oh. John, you are so sweet, darling. I do appreciate it. You've come all the way from California to be here with me tonight. Tallulah, please don't degrade yourself by groveling before me. I'll be only too happy to do it. Groveling? You'll be happy to do what? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy indeed to appear on this benefit for Miss Bankhead. <laughs> benefit? Who told you I needed a benefit? Well, it seemed rather obvious, my dear. Nobody in the theatre has seen you in months. Your name hasn't been on Broadway in a couple of years. Your picture was removed from the wall at Sardi's. And your mail at the Theatre Guild is marked Address Unknown. Uh, John, I happen to have been appearing on the big show, the greatest show on earth. Not the circus, to really. <laughs> The sawdust I walk on is not on a circus floor. <laughs> Well, why not come back to the theater, Tallulah, where you belong? Well, now, darling, I'm waiting for one of you divine authors to come up with a play suited to my talents. You know, I once wrote a play with you in mind. Really, John, darling, what was it? The Voice of the Turtle. <laughs> <laughs> and no doubt you had me in mind for the turtle role. I suppose that's a sample of the level of radio humor. I'd prefer, of course, that we kept the conversation at the intellectual level of my plays. Uh, very well, darling. May I help you down? <laughs> well, Tallulah, when I get back to the old crowd, I'll tell them I found you. Naturally, I won't tell them where. No, oh, just tell them I'm playing piano in a burlesque house. <laughs> oh, we'll be very secretive about it. Julie Harris won't say a word. Come here, Julie. Yes, John? Are you enjoying yourself here? Frightening, isn't it? Well, it is. <laughs> But you won't tell anyone about Tallulah's being on this radio show, will you? Oh, no. I wouldn't even dare tell anyone I was on the show. <gasps> Juliet, Tallulah Bankhead is a magic name in the theatre. Oh, I've always held Miss Bankhead in great esteem. <laughs> that always precedes the stab in the back. Go ahead, darling. You hold me in great esteem, but... There are no buts. I've always been excited and thrilled to see you in the theatre. But... I told you, no buts. As a young actress, I've learned so much from your career. Oh, well, thank you very much, Julie, darling. The most important thing I've learned is to save my money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Julie, darling, they say that to become great, an actress must suffer. And one more crack like that, and you're going to become the greatest actress in the American theater. <laughs> And it might interest you to know, my dear girl, that they wanted me to play in I Am A Camera. But fortunately, we found Bill Prince. <laughs> I'm not talking about the part of... Oh, hello, Bill. It's a pleasure to be here, Miss Bankhead. Well, I wonder how I overlooked you. How old are you, darling? Uh, 28. 
28. Well, that's a little young. But in a couple of years, uh, I'll get you on my way back. <laughs> oh, by the way, I hear they're going to make a movie out of I'm a Camera. Well, there's been some talk about it. I hope Julie will consent to play the lead. <laughs> Isn't he naive? <laughs> Don't you know who plays the lead in the motion picture versions of everybody's plays, darling? <laughs> is, that, is that why they say pictures are better than ever? <laughs> See, I can write these radio jokes. Not on this program, Buster. Tallulah, is this where you're going to spend the rest of your career? Don't you have any ambition? Take Julie here. She's great ambitions, haven't you, Julie? My ambition is to become a great actress. I've already been there, darling. <laughs> How about you, Bill Pratt? Well, my ambition is to become a great actor. Uh, you want to be a great actor? Well, be at my apartment tonight. I'll teach you to act up a storm. <laughs> and Johnny, what's your ambition? My ambition is to get out of here alive. <laughs> you should have come in that way. <laughs> Tallulah, you must have some ambition, some secret ambition. What is it? Well, now, John, confidentially, darling, now come here, listen. My ambition is that when I reach the age of 95, the age of 95, I'll be shot by a jealous wife. And now here's something else of interest to you. For, for, for your breathless moments. Chew dentine, the gum with <gasps> breathtaking flavor. Dentine tastes so good. Dentine freshens your breath. Dentine helps keep your teeth sparkling clean and white. Dentine, the gum with <gasps> breathtaking flavor. Before you go out and always after eating, drinking, smoking, refresh your breath with Dentine. You'll love Dentine chewing gum, for Dentine has a wonderful tingling, nippy flavor that lingers on and on. It's delicious. And remember, dentine helps keep your teeth white, too. Keep dentine handy. You'll enjoy refreshing your breath when you chew dentine. So, for breathless moments, for your breathless moments, chew dentine, the gum with <gasps> breathtaking flavor. Well, darlings, we come closer and closer to the end of our show and our season. Tallulah, as you know, this is my eighth appearance on this opus. Yes, George. And this is the moment for which I've waited so long. I feel now I can say to you what I wanted to say the very first time I saw you. Say it now, George. What have you been wanting to say to me, dear? Goodbye. <laughs> well, that's the story of my life. Well, George, I've tried. All my womanly wiles have been of no avail. However, I refuse to accept defeat. And I have here for you a little going-away gift. A framed portrait of someone who, in spite of your coldness, your aloofness, you are really desperately in love with. Here you are, my darling. A mirror? Exactly. <laughs> well, thank you, Tallulah, but this is hardly a new affair. Goodbye, darling. Uh, goodbye, George. I hope the two of you will be very happy. <laughs> well, so long, kid. Kid? Ethel, you've been on this show for two years, and that's the nicest thing you ever said to me. I really like you, Tallulah. And next season, I hope you get a hit play on Broadway and don't have to come back to radio. <laughs> Bite your tongue when you say that. I love my radio audience. Well, foiled again. Now, what do you mean? I thought if I could get you into a hit play, I could take over this show. Well, so long, Tallulah. I'll be seeing you in a <laughs> That's my song. Just practicing in case you get a play. So long. <laughs> well, Tallulah. Yeah, Phil. I want to thank you for being so nice to me and having me on the show all the time and letting me get a few laughs here and there. But just to show you how grateful I am, if you're not married by next September, I'll marry you. <laughs> if I'm not married. 
And next year we can call this the Mr. and Mrs. Big Show. <laughs> Au revoir. Or as we say in Brooklyn, wait till next year. <laughs> I got news for you. You're a doll. Well, Fred in Portland, we come to the parting of the ways. The show's almost over. Goodbye, Tallulah. Have a wonderful summer. Thank you, darling. Say, Tallulah, before I leave, uh, let me go over the instructions once more. You, you must remember this. You cannot send anybody. You have to go yourself. You walk up one flight of stairs, you'll see a lot of windows with letters over them. But you stand in line under the letter B. Now, that's right next to where I'll be standing, under the letter A. You just tell them what your last job was, you fill out a paper, and they give you $24 a week. Oh, Fred, thank you, well, darling. Don't thank me. It's not my money, only indirectly. So long, Tulu. Well, now, I must remind my chauffeur, Sylvester, to take me there the first thing Monday morning on my way to Tiffany's. Well, Tallulah. Groucho Pet. Well, if that's as far as you want to go. Oh, Groucho, why don't you stop? How can I stop before I start? Oh, Groucho, enough tomfoolery. Yes, enough tomfoolery. How about a little Groucho foolery? <laughs> What's neck? <laughs> or chin? Or shoulder? Or any spare part you've got left? <laughs> Groucho, for two years now, you've come on this show and badgered me and pestered me and pursued me, and I've always held out. What would you do if I suddenly said yes? To lower, I'd kill myself. <laughs> I bet you would. You bet I would. I mean, wouldn't. <laughs> Don't take my life. Take yours. Anyway. I bet you wouldn't. I'd kill myself. I bet you wouldn't. I bet I would. All right, Groucho, I'm yours. I'm yours. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that was Groucho Marx, and you bet your life. <laughs> Oh, uh, uh, Miss Bankhead. Yes, Mary, darling, what is it? Uh, well, sir, Miss Bankhead. <laughs> well, that's the last time I'll have to hear that this season. Well, what I want to say is that we of the musical organization of the big show have a little musical gift for you to remember us by. Right, Chorus? That's, that's right, Mary. Oh, isn't that sweet? Wherever you are this summer, we'll always think of you as... My darling, my darling. Thank you, my darlings of the Big Show Orchestra and Chorus. And now, there are a few other thank, thank yous I'd like to pass out now to the people who get the show on the road every week. First, a deep bow to our sponsors. I'll be back in the fall, so save up some more money, darlings. <laughs> to Meredith Wilson, whose genius has provided our show with the most exciting and scintillating music and radio, but who has not let his love for music stand in the way of playing for me while I sing. <laughs> to the authors, Goodman A, Selma Diamond, Maud Green, George Foster, and Frank Wilson, good luck to you, darlings, and your oxygen tents this summer. And of course, to our producer-director, the Engelback, who, as if he hasn't had enough of me up to now, will be preparing all summer to guide me through that new medium, which I will enter in the fall, uh, to Lula Vision. And I'm throwing away my script, and Dee's gonna faint in the control room, but Dee, darling, if I'm known as the mistress of ceremonies, I want you to know that our producer, Dee Ingleback, is our master and our guiding light. Thank you, Dee, for all the things you've done for all of us on the big show. And to all the other wonderful people who help put on the show, and last but certainly not least, to you, our wonderful audience out there. Until I see you again in the fall, darlings, may the good Lord bless and keep you whether near or far away, Ethel. May you find that long-awaited golden day today, Groucho. May your troubles all be small ones and your fortune ten times ten. Freddy. May the good Lord bless and keep you till we meet again, Portland. May you walk with sunlight shining and a bluebird in every tree, Earl. May there be a silver lining back of every cloud you see, Bill. 
Fill your dreams with sweet tomorrow. Never mind what might have been. Julie. May the good Lord bless and keep you till we meet again, Bill. May you long recall each rainbow, then you'll soon forget the rain, George. May the warm and tender memories be the ones that will remain. Meredith. Fill your dreams with sweet tomorrows, never mind what might have been. May the good Lord bless and keep you until we meet again. And Godspeed to our armed forces everywhere. Good night, darlings. This portion of The Bing Show has been brought to you by Chesterfield, the only cigarette that names all its ingredients. Sound off for Chesterfield, the cigarette that's much milder, with an extraordinarily good taste, and most important, no unpleasant aftertaste. By Anison for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. Dentine, the gum with breathtaking flavor. And Beeman's Pepsin, the gum that's great to chew and good for your digestion, too. The first half hour of the big show is presented by the makers of Reynolds Aluminum, the Reynolds Metals Company, who also bring you the Kate Smith Evening Hour on the NBC television network. This is Ed Hurley, he saying good night. <laughs> Join Mirth and Music with Phil Harris and Alice Faye next on NBC. Mm -hmm.